Well, Donald, first of all, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. You, know, you are certainly a mentor and a person I have uh, looked up to for a long time. So I'm excited to kind of go back to yesteryear. Yeah. So let's just let's just talk about you have a long and legendary career in media and broadcasting, particularly in public media. But why media? Why? Why did a young Donald Toms decide this is this is for me? You know, uh, there's something about serendipity. Mm -hmm. You know, the story I tell is that literally I was with a friend at a uh, um, job interview. Mm -hmm for an urban, uh, urban affairs uh, media, I mean, company mm -hmm. to get um, people jobs, mm -hmm. you know, in, the, in Baltimore City. And uh, I was wearing flip-flops, I was wearing shorts and a sweatshirt, mm -hmm. sitting in the corner, reading a magazine, waiting for her to come out. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is Marilyn Dobbins, she says, Donald, come here. And she introduced me to the president of the company. Mm -hmm. I was really embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, he said, you have a good voice. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, thanks. He said, do you ever think about being in television? No, no, but you know, I was a master of ceremonies for, for you know, all of my high school mm -hmm. <coughs> plays mm -hmm. or events. Mm -hmm. I do remember standing in the mirror in the bathroom mm -hmm. with a salt shaker mm -hmm. doing station breaks, mm -hmm. you know, just projecting that mm -hmm. voice. And so I went over and I started working for Channel 11. Now, I honestly believe somewhere it was going to happen. I was going to be in some sort of either entertainment or, mm -hmm. you know, publicity or something like that. That's what I, I thought I would do. But I was kind of, you know, at that point, I was at Morgan mm -hmm. State University and, uh, and went over. And, you know, after two interviews, I got hired. Had nothing to do with my voice. Right. I started working as a floor director you know, uh, for Channel 11 and where you learned confidence and you learned that the people who, the talent in front of the camera are counting on you not to make mistakes, mm -hmm. not to make them look bad. Mm -hmm. And so listening to the director sometimes and realizing that he didn't know what he was doing or what she was doing at times and kind of altering what they said, you know, in that sense. And so I think they saw it as, you know, something you know, something um, positive, and I got promoted to something called an operations director, mm -hmm. and uh, where I was directing station breaks. Okay. Now, let's go back for a moment. Yes. We're at operations, but I I'm still at this place where somebody sees you in flip-flops, and they love your voice, and, and you just kind of get into this. So, before or during the process that, that you became a, a floor director, Let's let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, what was it that gave you confidence that you could actually do the job? Was it was it you you were in it for a while and gained confidence, or, or you had a unique insight? Talk to me. About I, I I I think it. You know, um, my parents taught me and my brother to have confidence in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we were not intimidated by mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents always say, if you're talking to an adult, mm -hmm. don't look down at the floor, right. look them in the face, right. you know, because they're talking to you, you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. So I had the level of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, where the voice comes from, I, I don't know, because right. it is not a Baltimore accent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and I find that most people in businesses <clears throat> seem to like the way I, I speak. I mean, that's... And for various reasons, mm -hmm. you know, is that, you know, you know, when someone says, oh, my God, you're very articulate, you right. never know quite what that means. What that means, right. right. You know, you know, what is that code for something? Right. You know, but, but I did, I, when I walked in, um, you know, and my dad was a caterer. Okay. Uh, Part-time, and he would take my brother and I on catering jobs. And so there you are amongst a bunch of rich people. Right. You know, whether or not you're serving something, whether or not you're taking their codes, whether or not you were engaged in a conversation with him, mm -hmm. with them, whether or not you were the bartender mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At, a, at a function, mm -hmm. underage, by the way, you know, is that I think both my brother and I share the same sense of confidence that we can, that we can do it. And, um, and you, know, you know, there are several um, pinch yourself moments. Right. And one was when I walked into the studio the first day, mm -hmm. and I'm there by myself looking around, and I pinch, that, that one of the pinch, one of the pinch yourself yeah. moments. You know, you're there and thinking, how did I get here? Right. And knowing that I, was, I wasn't gonna leave. 
Right. You know, and uh, but but sooner or later, you know, I think every job I had, it was like looking for the next one. So you moved from floor director to operations. Floor director, I went into you know, you know, I, although I didn't push the buttons, you couldn't push the buttons in the commercial station. Someone else did. Right. But you had timing. You know, you had to direct station breaks, and at a commercial station, you cannot screw up. Right. Because it's money. Yeah, pressure packed environment. You know, and so you're telling the the, the folks who are, and you ha you have to have the confidence to tell the engineers mm. what to do. Mm. You know, and you know. And they believed in me, so it worked. And then, you know, sooner or later, you, as an operation director, you start directing shows that no one sees. Right. Learning to read, right. learning to do some of the children's shows. And so, again, you're, you're, it's, it's step by step, which I dearly appreciated. Mm, mm. You know, so it was just, it was the, I think it was the way it should, should have been done. I was learning all the way up. Mm -hmm. And then I graduated from college and, um, Many people said, my God, you should try this thing called Maryland Public Television. By then, there was a Maryland Center for Public Broadcasting. Okay. And several of my floor director and director friends had moved to MPT, or okay. had come to MPT. Okay. And, um, and they had a job open. I went over and, and got the job. Again, it was in master control. Mm. Mm. So I mean, I, it was like kind of a lateral move, mm -hmm. but the difference is that you come to public television and there is a world of difference. But tell us a little bit about the difference that you experienced. You think, and, and for our, those who may be watching, <clears throat> because technology has gone, has come so far. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take us back to what master control must have been like then. Sure. Well, you know, is that you have a board in front of you. Now, so when I was at here, I was actually pushing all the buttons. Okay. But remember, is that a television break is about three minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are 30 second commercial, there are 30 second spots. So it's like you're, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Especially having come from uh, Channel 11 in Baltimore, mm -hmm. where they were 10, 20 seconds, and it was moving like this the whole time, the entire time, right. that you almost couldn't catch your breath. Right. And then you come here, I'm not saying it was easier, but I had the experience to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you're putting you know, shows on the air. Right. You know, because you know, whatever, you know, you know, Wall Street Week was on the right. air here. Right. And it was interesting is that back in those days, I can't remember if we were, if we were taking a direct feed from PBS or we were taking a direct feed from like EEN. I mean, there were some, mm -hmm. all these different, different networks. Mm -hmm. um, but the technology is so different now because most public television stations, many public television stations don't have a master control. Right. Someone now, else. Now the reality is, is, is when you're in master control during that period of time, I mean, you, you're the stopgap. I mean, e everything starts and stops Absol through the master control. Absolutely. So there's no redundancy. There's nope. no backup. Nope. You're it. Exactly right. You know, and so you learn to think quickly on your feet, and uh, because you know, for the most part, it ran smoothly. But you know, I came in one one morning, and I was the only person in the building. Wow. The engineer, the engineer wasn't <laughs> here, and and I was calling someone. And honestly, that morning, I put us on the air <laughs> with the national anthem. You know, mm -hmm. I did that. I loaded the tape machine mm -hmm. for the first show, and 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 you know, and the and the guy rolled in. He had a flat tire, and God, were there cell phones back then? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And he walked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all the way here. Wow. So you, you, you know, and, and, and I think in, in doing live television, which I used to love, is that you do think quickly on your yeah. feet. Whether or not it's floor directing. Yeah. Master control for that three minutes is live. Right, right, right. And uh, I was you know, talking to our friend Michael Steyer, and he did a show called The Critics Place live. Mm -hmm. Well, the assistant director did not know how to time a show. Mm. And so I found, my, found myself writing. I did a timesheet for him. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, and then finally they asked me to, to do the show, so I was assistant director on a live show. And it was it was it was it was crazy good. Right, right. You know, because you're 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 um you're in this 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 family and that's what I found about public television is that 
even though money was not the object, right. doing a superior job was. was. Mm -hmm. And so the shows just, everyone wanted the shows to be perfect because you knew you had an audience out there and uh, you didn't try to, you didn't want anything to screw up. But it's live television. You lose cameras, you lose mics, you lose lights. You know, it's, things happen, but you got to keep the show that's must right. go on. And sometimes the host will just, you know, will choke up right. for some reason. It is always how do you. So now you're, you're, let's, floor director, operations director, now master control, and, assistant and now, director. now you're assistant director. Yeah. So it's one thing to understand the pacing and timing, but let's not gloss over the fact that you had a real talent for how to, how to, Construct movement around a show. Um, so, so where did yeah, that? Yeah. Where well, you, did, I, how did that develop? Yeah, and I, but I, again, though, I don't think that at that point. I mean, even when I was directing these half-hour shows at BAL, I hardly remember them. Okay. Because they were in and out, and um, and they didn't have any commercials in them. They were right. they were the public affairs shows. Okay. Um, but then when you get to to here. You're watching, you're watching how, indeed, the producer works, mm -hmm. what the producer's doing, the executive producer mm -hmm. who's just standing back, mm -hmm. you know, making sure. The, and then the director who, in those days back here, he had a huge control okay. board in front of him, mm -hmm. and he was switching. Mm -hmm. And I am calling shots for him mm -hmm. because we have blocked the script, right. like Ready Camera 3, so mm -hmm. that, that was for the camera operator, mm -hmm. as well as for the director. Mm -hmm. Your next shot's camera three on mm -hmm. the close-up, and I was directing the f cameras, mm -hmm. the cameramen, mm -hmm. and, and what was coming up next. <clears throat> and that, again, helped me, and when I became a director, I mean, sometimes I was a script follower right. for the director. At one point, I was actually holding a cup with a Coke in it <laughs> so that the director who smoked <laughs> would dip his ashes yeah, into that instead of in the control room. So it's all those those kinds of things. And um, and everything built on everything else, mm. you know, to be honest with you. And then the director left and I became the director. So again, not to gloss over a few things, but just to unpack it a little bit. I think it's extraordinary, uh, but, I, but I think you kind of begin to see giftedness, okay? Um, you know, and I find that when something comes natural to a person, they're operating in their area of gifting that others might struggle with. So, for instance, I know plenty of producers, and I know you do too, who struggle with t my live TV, struggle with, you know, if you, if you put them in a place where they have time and they can think, uh, but you thrived. I thrive. In those environments. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, you have to prepare for it, though. And that's the other thing is that, you know, if, if someone said to me, Donald, you're a detailed person, I'd say, oh, no. Mm. But yeah, in producing the program, you have to be. Mm -hmm. You know, as the producer, because as the producer, you're putting everything together here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you're giving it to the director. Mm -hmm. Now, that was in the days when everything here was done in a studio. Right which is completely different now, whereas everything is in the field. Is, is in the field. So, um, uh, so you, you kind of learn that. But, but then I remember I used to direct a, the, um, a show called In Person, mm -hmm. which was hosted by Dr. Frederick Breidenfeld, mm -hmm. who was the head and founder mm -hmm. of Maryland Public Television. Mm -hmm. And he said to me one day, when are you gonna get off of your ass and become a producer? Mm. Well, I've been directing now for five years and I thought, in the back of my head, that would be great, but directors don't become producers. That was in the back of my head, because mm. it just wasn't done. It had not been done. Mm -hmm. Not been done at MPT, or had not been done. Had not been done at MPT. Okay. Okay. And so, um, because there are folks who would debate you that you're thinking out of two different sides of the brain. Mm. You know, the, the producer really is big picture. Mm -hmm you know, then whittling it down and being the detailed person and turning it over. And so um, I applied for a job as a producer mm -hmm. for News and Public Affairs, mm -hmm. and the show was called Up on the Farm. Mm -hmm. It was an ag show. There was no way I was going to get this show. Mm -hmm. Well, I got the show. Mm -hmm. And my producer, Everett Marshburn, mm -hmm. uh, my executive producer, you know, the two of us, you know, we grew up in Baltimore City. 
Right. And so what we going to add to this show that didn't make us look like idiots? And the staff was extremely concerned. Mm -hmm. And one year or eight months after that, after I took over the show, my boss, Warren Park, called me in the office and said, I have something to tell you. And I said, what? I'm thinking I'm fired. I did something right. wrong. He said, for the first time in its history, Up on the Farm is now showing up in the ratings regularly. Wow. So what was the secret sauce today? You got two Baltimore guys that, that don't know much about agriculture. So was Well, it, we okay. didn't. You, you, you learned, okay. <laughs> you know, you do you, you learn. But, you know, I was talking to one of my, uh, my uh, producers just two, three months ago. Okay. And I said, Betty, what was it? Why? Why? She says, because instead of you staying in the office like the old producer did, you were out in the community. You were doing stories that people cared about. You were demanding that the writer simply not take things from the, uh, you know, from the teletype machine, right. but for the writer to find stories to do. And that's what happened. We, we made it real to, to the farmers mm. or the agriculture. And we included people that they didn't normally see on the show. So people who weren't in agriculture could relate because these Absolutely. are compelling people's sto stories about people, yeah, real people, yeah, real exact, places. Exactly right. Because when you think about the fact that at least back then, it was 1980, 3% um, of the population were in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So why MPT did the show in the first place, I'll never know. I mean, mm -hmm. would you do it now? 3% of your audience, do you think? Probably not. Yeah, you probably might. So, so then you have to turn it into a, to a, a more of a lifestyle show. Right. You know, and we used to do commodities every day and I mean, every Monday. So we kind of got rid of that and turned it more into a lifestyle ag show and we created, you know, certain things. So we did and we, I did that for, I did that for, you know, for a while and then then for some reason, there's a show here called Aviation Weather mm -hmm. that was on Friday nights mm -hmm. that turned itself into a 15 minute daily show mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. called AM Weather. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, Boston Michael Steyer said, we need a companion to that show. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So we turned up on the farm until into farm day mm. every morning at 5.30 we taped the mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And it was distributed through CEN. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, it was my first time in, in, in getting that national, that, that was my first national, exposure. big national exposure. So, and we did that for one year. Okay. And then I couldn't do it anymore. So yeah. let's, let's, again, it's, it's rapid fire, man. Just listening to your trajectory, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you're, you're you're moving from one for others would appear to be one hot seat to another, not because of anything yeah. wrong, but because of the pressure associated with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you move from doing a, a weekly show to a daily show, a daily 15-minute show. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I think, though, in essence, I, I stayed in one place long enough okay. to to make it work for me and for the and for the station and then I was ready to move on I mean I never wanted to and I found that myself I never wanted to stay in one place that long so the director for five years was a producer and then I got a, promoted to an executive producer and then I think head of TV you know but it was just I, I needed I needed that movement and you know and here in public television we were encouraged to just create programs um, because there's so many local opportunities. And so, you know, to produce programs that we, we went out into the community and, you know, and, and dealt with people. I used to invite, you know, different groups up because I was also in charge of um, engagement. Mm. And different, we would invite groups up and say, what do you want to see mm -hmm. on public television? Now, before we leave this conversation, I want to talk to you about as you look back on your career, uh, what has meant the most to you? But while we're telling your sto talking about your story, your journey, when did you absolutely fall in love with public television? When was the moment? That that you first said, day I walked in the door. First day. First day I walked in the door because at that point there were 300 people working here, mm. and it felt like Hollywood. Mm because there were people in costumes. Every one of the studios was working mm. all the time. 
mm -hmm. day and night. Mm -hmm. They were shooting dramas and musicals mm -hmm. and things like that. And I'm thinking, this is, and the diversity, you know, uh, you know of every kinds of, you know, people. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it, with it that day. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's like you're working for the state, so right. you know, you know, you, you're not going to become a millionaire working here. Right, right. But the fact that you had a, such a family, and this was a family from the, even now, when I walk in here now, and I've been gone for 20 years, right. you know, I still know so many people here, and I still hang out with mm -hmm. some of the people here. So it's that, it's that public television. But again, when I even went to PBS, mm -hmm. it was the same. So let's talk about that. I mean, you, you, so your, your career trajectory, this is the place um, that took you to the next level. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're at the executive producer level, you're head of television, you, you, you've risen to the executive ranks and you, you look back. So when did you know it was time to, to move to PBS, to move to the national yeah. stage? It, 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 uh, it took me about six months to realize that I was absolutely and totally bored. Mm. And I said to my boss, I said, I got more challenges. I got nothing left, you know. Right. He said, we'll, we'll keep creating them. I said, you know, I had two kids. I'm thinking, I'm not making any money either. <laughs> and there's that. And, uh, I think that's an important part. Yeah, that's an important part, <laughs> you know. But I had been going to PBS annual meetings. I've been going to other national places. So I, I was, you know, I did uh, New Country Video, which was a national show. I did, you know, the, the farm show, national show. So I would participate in panels at a lot of places. So I started to get my name out there nationally mm -hmm. and um which was terrific and so when a job opened at pbs um i was the head of program management which is just one of these odd titles mm -hmm. and um and i got hired mm -hmm. you know to do it and um when i talked to jennifer lawson who was the then head of first head of national programming i said she said, what did you think of the interview? I said, I liked it. I said, but the place seemed a little dry. I said, people didn't have any energy. She says, that's why we want you here. Mm. You know, so, you know, I, I did go to PBS and I created all sorts of things, mm -hmm. you know, um, like um, there was no standard time for shows, mm -hmm. no standard length. Mm -hmm. And the, the stations were, you know, were, you know, you sit on the show. So anyway, so I created the, 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 the standard length for programs, okay. 56, 46. Okay. I get booed by independent filmmakers sometimes, you know, for that. Uh, I also created a show that's still on called Independent Lens. Yeah. You know, began, again, though, out of my own, it was the fact I'd go to independent um, uh, groups because I was the liaison with independent filmmakers and, um, and there was no place for them. Right. There was no place for independent films. And yet, though, Congress had created ITVS, mm -hmm. you know, which is the Independent Television Service, to, mm -hmm. but there was no place for them to go. Mm -hmm. So I created Independent Lens, and, um, which is still in the air, but it's different than the way it was. Mm -hmm. You know, ITVS came along and just gave it money, gave the filmmakers money, and it's perfect. You know, so, the way it is. So, so you're now blazing a trail also at PBS. You're, you're innovating, I, I you're think starting, so. uh, you're creating platforms for producers. Yeah, again, because, yes, we were told to be innovative because, and, um, and I, I, I took them for... for right. For, <laughs> what, I, I, what? I, I, took, I took them for the board, and so I would do certain things like that. Right. And, and I kept, you know, but I, I wasn't a content creator right. there, even though um, we could acquire programs and I would go in and fix them. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, and and so it was using the skills as a director, as a producer and a planner, you know, in this, you know, this job and, uh, and it worked really well for me. And I would have stayed except my boss left. So this is the reason why now you have another opportunity to explore uh, maybe greener pastures, right? Well, and just interestingly enough is that the woman who hired me, Kathy Quattrone at PBS, she left and she went to Discovery. Mm -hmm. And about two months later, she called me. She says, how would you like to join me at Discovery? And I said, the dark side? <laughs> and she gave me so many reasons why it would be good. So you're back in commercial television. I'm back in commercial television. So I want you to give us the journey from PBS to, to Discovery. And, and your return to all things public media. And then I want you to really look back for us and, and tell us what you see looking back 
to the young Donald Toms wearing flip-flops who yeah. decided to venture into television. Yeah, it's interesting because when I went to Discovery, I was, um, I was the vice president of, of production and content mm -hmm. and producing shows for women. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I was the only male executive on the team. Mm -hmm. And, but there was just a great group of women I worked with and we did create really great shows because we vowed to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, and but yet though once the commercial intervention starts mm -hmm. you know it starts to lose its l luster a bit you know when you have to you know create um, uh, product integration or product placement mm -hmm. you know you have to be creative so it doesn't look like you're really selling your soul out which you don't do in, in public television right. and 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 you know that was successful for for like eight years I did one show that was the most successful show I ever did. It was called John and Kate Plus Eight. Yeah. It, it it blew up everywhere. Um, and um, I did it, I did it. I, I became less enchanted over the years. But, you know, um, financially wise, it was good for me. And then we parted company. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, um, and I met Paula Kerger at a party. She said, how would you like to come back to PBS? I said, what? <laughs> so you're back, back home. I, I, I came back, you know, to probably the best job I ever had where I was head of all arts, you know, drama, music, performance, all those big shows that we know that come down. Back I had nothing passion. to do with science or history. Yeah. I this is your passion. And it was, it's, you know, it is my passion. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, um, so, um, and then, you know, after five years, it's not that I didn't like the job, but I was done. Yeah. So now, you reach the apex twice, the top of the hill twice. Well, you know, I, you know, but you know, it's it's it's, I, and I consider myself lucky, you know, because you know, even now, you know, I I, I do some consulting with you. Yeah. I'm on the air for, for for the you know for, uh, for public television, and I sit on boards of theaters. And I can't, I, I, do I want to ever go back to work full time? Absolutely not. Well, let, let me ask you to do this in 30 seconds. Looking back now, how would you sum up your extraordinary career? I, I think that the fact that I never gave up, and I, I, there are a couple of camera operators, uh, Tim Pugh's out there, who has known me for 30 years. If I wasn't having fun at what I was doing, I'd go. Because you have to, you have to have fun. You can't take it so seriously at the end of the day. I didn't go home and cry about maybe once or twice, you know, but at the end of the day is that you have to love what you do and, and, and make it better, not just for you, but for everybody else you're working with. Donald Toms, I think you just gave us not only the key to being a successful media executive, but the key to life. Thank, Thank you, buddy. You. Alrighty, that was good.